Wonderful. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, we apologize that we had a little bit of um, last minute uh, technical difficulties, as I think we're all familiar with these webinars. So thanks for your patience. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, we are really excited for you to uh, join us for our first uh, virtual speaker series. Uh, my name is Xiaoyan Zhao. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana. Uh, if you are not familiar with WAC, we are a hub for international exchange, dialogue, and learning located in the U.S., uh, located in specifically Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we are a member of two national networks with the Global Ties U.S. and the World Affairs Councils of America. And uh, on any regular time uh, year, we facilitate international professional and youth exchanges through the U.S. Department of State and provide speakers programs and educational opportunities for our Kentuckiana region throughout the year. Now, we are a member-supported organization, but we are not a member exclusive in our programs, um, which are open to the public. So we're very excited to have many of you joining, a number of you joining us from other cities and states. Um, as with every organization, we have had to adapt to the needs of these, this difficult time, uh, but we wanted to make sure that you still have access to expert analysis and discussions on topics that impact all of us locally, nationally, and globally. So, more than ever, we are all experiencing a global crisis, even while we are isolated in our little corner of the world. Um, but today, we are very excited to welcome Mr. John Zogby, uh, founder and senior partner of John Zogby Strategies. A few weeks ago, as I was putting together our speaker series here, I got an email from John, John's company uh, about his latest broadcast episodes, uh, the Zogby Report, which that week was about the 2020 elections. And I realized up until then, I had almost forgotten that we had an election uh, planned for later this year. And at any other time, I'm sure it will be the number one or one of the top headlines in the news. And then I realized that I haven't seen much coverage about it. Um, so having the pleasure of hosting John two times in the last decade, I quickly sent John a very, uh, an email and asked if he would be willing to share his expertise and polling with our audience today and uh, be the first speaker for this series. So here we are, he's very graciously uh, agreed to do so. So I'm gonna give a quick introduction to John and then I'll give you a quick uh, run of show today. John Zogby is a pollster, uh, author, trend spotter, and thought leader. John has spent the past four decades as one of the most accurate pollsters in the world, conducting business in 80 countries and leading the way in finding the meaning, the story, direction, and usefulness of the data collected. You can find more information about John and subscribe to his weekly podcast, The Zogby Report, on his website, uh, johnzogbystrategies.com. Before I turn it over to John, just a quick reminder about your functionalities today. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and we'll provide a link to it after the program is over. I will ask Mr. Zogby to provide uh, about five, 10 minutes of remarks. After that, he and I will discuss a couple of questions I have as well as some questions that uh, many of you have submitted ahead of this during your registration. After our discussion, we will go into a Q&A Keep in mind, you can submit questions at any time during this program. We will collect them all and answer as many of them as we can during the Q&A. If you prefer, you can ask a question verbally. Just raise your hand and your controls on the bottom and we will unmute you. For this webinar, we will not be using the chat box, so please make sure to submit all questions via the Q&A only. So now, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Mr. John Zogby. John? Hi, thank you so much, Yin. Thanks for the introduction and the invitation. It's happy to be, I'm happy to virtually be back in Northern Kentucky, uh, where I enjoyed myself very much uh, the previous two times that I was there uh, with you and your organization. I hope everyone is, is staying safe and healthy. Uh, our 
world has turned upside down indeed. And yes, there is an election and there will be an election. So I'm going to keep this brief. There will be a lot of things on your mind, and I'm sure that uh, I won't get to many, if not all of them, um, in five or ten minutes. And so I'm happy to address whatever your, your questions may be. So first of all, uh, as I see it right now, there are five overriding themes for this election that I think we all need to pay attention to. The first, uh, these are in no special order of importance, they're all important. The first overriding theme is science versus skepticism. Uh, Democrats will, will make a case, depending on how strong they can make the case, for the need to pay attention to science. Um, certainly in terms of, of climate change, particularly in an important issue, the important issue for young voters. And that's something, of course, we want to pay very close attention to. Will young voters turn out to vote? Science is something that younger voters, college educated voters are going to pay attention to. Um, it's going to be science versus skepticism. There is, uh, depending on your point of view, either a healthy amount of skepticism or an unhealthy amount of skepticism. And that's being underscored not only by uh, candidates and parties' positions on the environment, but obviously COVID-19 and who to believe, what to believe. Shall we go ahead and uh, pretend that everything is, is going back to normal sooner rather than later, or should we pay attention to the scientists um, who, who are urging us to continue as we are doing right now? The second overriding theme is going to be empathy versus rage. Uh, Donald Trump was elected uh, three and a half, almost three and a half years ago um, uh, as a disruptor, as uh, uh, someone who was able to capitalize on a, a, a certain amount of, of rage that uh, uh, certain groups of voters felt about the elites and about uh, the changes in their world over which they had no control, changes in demographics, changes in the, the economy, changes in uh, America's position in the world. So this is going to be then uh, a, a battle of empathy versus rage. Along those same lines, the third theme is stability versus disruption. Uh, are folks happy with having a disruptor in chief? There certainly are a decent amount of voters who do prefer that. We see and we can make no mistake about the fact that Donald Trump's numbers, approval numbers, remain stable. Um, nothing to brag about, but nothing to worry about either. Today, his average job approval rating is 46%. Remember, he was elected with 46% of the popular vote. Democrats, when Democrats have won in the last 50 years, it's because their candidate has been seen as the more empathetic of the two candidates, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. Clearly, a re, an example in reverse was Hillary Clinton in 2016, who really was never able to show that side of, of her. So it's going to be then uh, empathy versus rage, stability versus disruption. The fourth theme, healthcare expansion versus healthcare contraction. Um, Democrats certainly are going to promise, if not uh, Medicare for all, then at least healthcare for all, probably in a, a bending to, to the left in the party, uh, uh, some sort of uh, public option to ensure that uh, we get to the levels of insurance coverage that we, we're headed to uh, under the Affordable Care Act. The fifth and, and newest um, of these themes that I've just added in is the New Deal versus the New Deal Plus. This is very interesting. Donald Trump has transformed himself into a Santa Claus in many ways, and that's going to be powerful, uh, uh, a powerful theme. We are on, on path to be spending right now $6 trillion in various forms of stimulus and recovery, and perhaps by September as many as three to four trillion 
more dollars. Uh, Donald Trump has transformed himself from a conservative and, uh, in, in most ways to um, a combination of, of FDR and Andrew Yang. It's gonna be intriguing to see how Joe Biden then frames this whole issue of government spending, government stimulus, and so on. Those are the five overriding themes. Uh, as an essential part of all of that is kind of a backdrop. We have obviously have the coronavirus, a crisis situation that we have never experienced before. We have not only a re record number of lost jobs, every job that was created uh, post the last recession has been eliminated plus some, and we still have more that will be eliminated. And the issue then is not simply getting people back to work, but what is the future of jobs going to be? Not simply jobs versus gigs, but also in an age of AI and an age of, uh, of robots, um, uh, you know, to what degree are people going to be working and what are they gonna be working at? And then of course, as I've mentioned before, the climate. That will be an overriding issue, particularly for young people. By way of closing, uh, Democrats are facing a, a dilemma, a problem that they have faced much of the time in elections in the last 50 years. The left of the party, the progressive wing, going back to McCarthy and McGovern and Ted Kennedy and so on, versus an establishment wing. To some degree, the, those um, wounds are healing this time around. When those wounds are not healed, Democrats lose. We have Sanders embracing Biden. We have Elizabeth Warren embracing Biden. We have the left leadership embracing Biden. The thing is, can they deliver their base to Biden? Some examples of polling that we've done, others have done suggest young people are still not sold on him. Uh, last two points, uh, Democrats also face another problem that they faced several election cycles over the last 50 years, and that's identity politics. Who's the running mate? Um, if you nominate a white man, then th the running mate must be a fill in the blank. Uh, Joe Biden has promised a woman, but is it gonna be a woman of color? Is it gonna be a progressive woman? Is it going to be a moderate woman? Um, expect some sort of a battle on this one. And then finally, just making its way into the mainstream press is the Me Too movement. And the whole issue of a woman named Tara Reid, who at one time was an aide to Joe Biden, who claims that um, he has sexually assaulted her. Uh, and now there's a split within the Me Too leadership as to whether this, need, this issue needs to be aired, whether or not there's any evidence, whether or not uh, she should be and he should be investigated in this matter. Stay tuned on that. All of which is to suggest if the election were held today, Joe Biden would win both the popular vote and uh, most of those key battleground states. But the election is not today and Democrats have some mending that, uh, that they have to do and some selling to the public, especially younger members of the public. That's kind of the view in brief. And now I'm happy to entertain any questions from, from Yin and, and from whoever is out there listening. Thanks. Great, thanks, John. Um, we had a number of uh, questions that came in uh, very specifically about the mechanics of the elections and the integrity of the election, what it, what it, what it might mean for it. So, how will it actually be run? Do you think in person, mail-in? I know it's still November, so we don't know yet. Um, but just in terms of how this might affect the participation rate, uh, the trust in the system, we had a number of people asking, um, you know, you have, do you have any projections on the mail-in ballot? Or um, is there any validity to this uh, criticism about elections being a mail-in? type of balloting since all of the census has been done by mailing and, and online. 
Mm -hmm. with that. Obviously, this is a complicated one, uh, not the least of which is the, as a reason is that we've never been here before. We've just never been in this kind of situation. So first of all, there will be an election. There must be an election. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but um, the Constitution says the first Tuesday after the first Monday, it would take um, an amendment to the Constitution in order to even postpone an election. There is no provision for an emergency uh, uh, postponement of any kind. So let's get that out of the way. If there's a constitutional scholar out there who disagrees, I, you know, I, I'd love to hear that. I doubt it, uh, though. Now, the logistics of it. Um, uh, we can probably count on the fact that um, it will not be in person, uh, that we better be prepared to do it al alternative in an al alternative way. It certainly cannot be done by email uh, because uh, elections are hacked anyway, and that is a part of our present and will be a growing part of, of our future. Um, that is just something that uh, we have no fail safe method for. Um, and so you know, we're looking at, and this is what the buzz is, of some form of mail-in uh, election. Now, for those who worry about that, remember there are lots and lots of absentee ballots that are collected by mail. Um, it's been, been done any number of years now in states like Washington and, and Oregon. There are other states as well that have used it as part of the system. The issue is gearing up in time. Um, uh, can um, the, the uh, uh, election boards, which are a matter of the states, and who then in turn have election commissioners in every county of the United States. With all respect to those election commissioners, these are political appointees. Every county has Democratic commissioners and Republican commissioners. Um, political patronage that's involved, but can they gear up in time? Can ballots be printed in time? Those are key questions uh, I can't answer. I don't see any reason why that cannot happen. Will the election be pure? You know, when elections are close, then you see how impure elections can be. Uh, ballots that are not counted, people who feel that um, they were uh, uh, suppressed, actual cases of legal uh, and court challenged cases of suppression. Uh, let's put it this way, it, it's a very important election. It'll be conducted by mail and look out, especially if it's close. It's, it's going to be problematic. Have you seen any evidence of states really kind of gearing up for this mailing option um, as a more of a possible alternative? Good question. I have only read, I haven't spoken to any, any officials in boards of elections, but from what I've read, the states, uh, many of the states are, are discussing this option. Obviously, the leadership for, for this is going to come uh, from uh, Congress, making some kind of a provision, and then that has to fan out then to, to governors and state legislatures and secretaries of state who mm -hmm. govern elections. That, those are normally political appointees as well. Um, a different question, um, you know, this is more for our organizations like ours. Um, we really, our work is very much about connecting people internationally through international exchanges, keeping people globally informed. Do you see anything in your research, um, evidence of people more likely, more or less likely to, um, to engage, disengage with this whole globalization move? You know, we've been kind of, it's been a question in the last couple of years anyway, mm -hmm. um, in light of this pandemic and um, so many differences internationally, how we're dealing with this. Um, how do you think, I mean, are any of these issues going to factor into this election? You know, how people view foreign policy, uh, global cooperation, et cetera? Yeah, you know, we've got to treat this moment of ours as, as a moment of insularity. 
uh, for a lot of reasons. That counts for our next door neighbors, let alone our cross border uh, neighbors. Uh, people are mainly focused on, on staying healthy and staying safe. We've seen uh, that this president uh, has been able uh, to, uh, to really rev up the public on the issue of immigration and on limiting uh, numbers of people from coming in. We just saw an executive order, in fact, uh, that was passed that many of us, most of us never dreamed that, that we would see. There is a temporary moment in this country uh, uh, as a result in particular of the virus where there's a caution about who enters and who doesn't enter. That includes, incidentally, not simply internationally, but it includes the Rhode Island State Police checking drivers coming in to see if those drivers are coming in from New York City mm -hmm. or not. And so that will treat as, uh, as, as a temporary sort of issue. But as you may know already, Two of the books that I've written have been about our first global generation, our global citizens, millennials, and uh, even more so, if one can believe it, Generation Z, who are very much networked with other people, uh, other cultures, have a greater appreciation than older age cohorts. And so um, uh, in terms of engagement, I think your organizations put a premium on having these kinds of, of dialogues, cross-border dialogues enabled by technology, you know, to ensure that um, we keep those who are uh, citizens like your members who are uh, inclined, you know, to, to reach out. Um, you, uh, you keep them connected and networked. And be aware of the fact that, that younger folks already are. Right. And and that actually leads to the next question of this, you know, uh, are there, do you see significant generational differences or other kinds of divides perhaps that might significantly affect this, um, this, this uh, election in terms of where they are on the issues? Um, you mentioned the climate change, I think, as one earlier. Yes. Uh, but are there any other things that you see that might uh, affect in terms of the students' engagement. Um, what, it relates to another question one of our uh, viewers had asked about, you know, right now kids are in, out of school. Um, yes. You know, 18 seniors just turning 18, they're actually able to uh, register and vote. How is all this impacting, you know, that, uh, that, that engage and voter engagement? Well, you know, you know again, this is a, a good one. It's a complicated question because you know, the president was going to run on the economy and his success with the economy. And when I say success, understand that the, the person at the top gets the credit or the blame, whether they had anything directly to do with it. Um, he was going to take the credit. Now, I think we can all agree that the, the uh, coronavirus was a sucker punch. Um, uh, that you don't want to see anybody uh, uh, have, have to deal with. Um, but the issue now is complicated because the president is presiding over a country that is where 26 million people in the last four weeks have applied for unemployment benefits and more to come. You know, we don't really see that slowing down over the next couple of weeks. Point being then, the issue for young people is going to be, hey, I was just getting started. It's just getting started after the last recession. I was on a path. My gig was good or my job was good. I was starting to think about the future and about settling a little bit. And now none of us know what the future is. Longer term, the future is rosy. Um, we will create jobs, um, not only tech related jobs, but right brain connected jobs. Problem is that the short term is going to be ugly. Uh, no economy can transform itself mm -hmm. so rapidly. And so are young people going to go into this election jaded uh, because they had been working and now their hopes had been dashed? Or are they going to go in hopeful? Uh, are they going to go in and say, we need more disruption? Uh, we were 
promises were made to us and the promises weren't delivered, or are they going to go in seeking real change? That, this is a very important election, and I obviously don't have the answers to that. Now, yeah. now I should point out, we are polling monthly for Forbes. They're 30 under, third, on, under 30 um, section in Forbes.com, and we'll have a new poll out the first week of May, uh, again, on 18 to 29-year-olds, um, and how they view this election and how they view these greater questions as well. Great. Are you going to have that poll or information up on your website as well? It'll be on our website Excellent. and it'll be on Forbes.com as well. Great. Um, how do you see, I mean, you've covered so many of these elections and really your, I think one of the big claims to fame is the, the Gore versus Bush mm. <laughs> election call. Yeah, but I go uh, back to McKinley, I should uh, you know, I go, <laughs> So I, I think one of the things, uh, curious in terms of all of that uh, experience, how do you see this one as being different, or is it really any different from the, the previous ones? Oh, it's different. Oh, okay. it's very, very different. We've never had a president like Donald Trump before. This is the marriage of reality, celebrity, culture, and politics. We all sort of knew that it was coming. Uh, that's why we talk about Oprah running and Kanye running and, you know, whatever. The, this is... Uh, We've never had a president like this before. We've never, never had a president who um, uh, disrupts and disturbs all of the conventions of politics and, and communication. We've never had an election, um, you know, we had never had an election before Ronald Reagan with a septuagenarian. Uh, running for a second term. Now we're going to have two septuagenarians running. And the important thing is um, no one questions Donald Trump's age as a factor, but they do question Joe Biden's age um, as a factor. Frankly, Biden won all those primaries, and I think he's healthy and robust, but I think the questions we need to ask um, uh, will we have octogenarians running? Remember, we are healthier than we've ever been uh, before. Us baby boomers are going to have a million of us reach the age of 100, in, uh, 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 living healthy, robust lives. What's 78? Is this a transitional election? Is, for Democrats, is Joe Biden in there to stop the bleeding? before a millennial generation steps in? Or is Joe Biden going to be an important historical character? These are things we, we never know. It conjures up in my mind as a Catholic. I, I was old enough to remember uh, the election of uh, John, Giuseppe Rancali to become Pope John the 23rd. He was 74 years old and everybody said, don't worry about him. Even though he's a reformer, he's gonna die in the next couple of years and we can move on. Well, he didn't die in the next couple of years uh, and he become, became one of the great reformers in Catholic church history. So yeah, this is a very different election. There are many other ways too, but let's move on. Well, I, just one last question and then we're gonna move it over to Q and A. Um, and that is really related to some of the other races. Uh, you. Uh, what other races are you looking at um, that you think is really going to be significant in terms of this? Episode? Yeah. So in the Senate, you know, Democrats need four seats to flip the Senate. Um, really three if they elect the president. Um, we're assuming that the Democrat elected a couple of years ago, Doug Jones in Alabama, is behind in the polls, so Democrats lose a seat. But um, among the, the, the Senate seats I'm looking at very closely, uh, Martha McSally in Arizona is running against the astronaut and husband of Gabby Gifford, Mark Kelly. And she's been running behind five, six, seven points in, in every poll. There's a possible Democratic pickup and Arizona actually turning blue into a blue state. Uh, Colorado is another one. Cory Gardner was elected uh, five and a half years ago. He's running against a very popular Democratic governor, John 
former governor, John Hickenlooper, and Gardner is uh, endangered. Let's put it, Joni Ernst in, uh, in Iowa, also uh, an endangered senator, as is Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. Uh, Democrats, well, you know, Amy McGrath is a, a, a military veteran and actually either running neck and neck or ahead by you know, three or four points in, in every poll. Um, so those are four off the top of my head that I'm watching very closely. Great. Well, and also two races in Georgia. Georgia is another one of those burgeoning blue states. And uh, there are two seats that are up in, in Georgia with strong Democratic candidates. Great. Well, that gives us uh, quite a number of things to, to think about already. And um, we do have a couple of questions um, that, from our audience. So we're going to go ahead and move into the Q&A session. I'm going to try to kind of go back and forth between the ones that we have received ahead of time, uh, some of the ones that's just uh, sent out right now. And then we may also have people who will be raising their hand and speaking out um, uh, verbally. So I'm going to start with um, one of our uh, the questions that was sent in. And that is, um, what, what about the potential voters who are not being naturalized due to USCIS uh, canceling in-person ceremonies but not giving a virtual or emergency ordered citizenship for those who are just waiting for that ceremonial element? Any that thoughts? is a matter of, of legal cases. And I don't know how that turns out, uh, but and I certainly don't know if it turns up this year, and if there's even time for court decisions, naturalizations, and then registration to vote. I, I really just have no idea how that plays out. That's that uh, that makes sense. Um, one of our questions that's sent in right now um, is theme of how this how how does this pandemic has been handled by the administration, it, will that be a factor in the elections? It most certainly will. Um, and it will in, in a couple of ways. You know, one is the whole question of, of uh, um, the president's demeanor. Um, you know, he's, he's holding daily briefings and he's undercutting his own uh, science people. He's also, um, you know, in a display, and I don't mean to sound partisan here, but sometimes a little hard um, to not, uh, but just observing him, there's a real insecurity there. Every day turns into a battle uh, with, with the press. Every day turns into, I said, but no one would listen to me. I did, but nobody paid mm -hmm. any attention. You know, and the rest of us say, hey, you're the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Everybody pays attention to you. Just let the scientists talk. So, I think that a case can be made that after, you know, the early days when this was sort of dismissed and misunderstood, that, you know, once the, the, the vice president was appointed and formed a task force, the president has actually risen to the occasion. Um, he's, he's gone through uh, a very difficult situation with, with Congress, you know, with uh, you know, still the remnants of, of hyper-partisanship, you know, and uh, it tacking on some, some goodies to, um, you know, a number of these stimulus bills. But the bottom line is money had to be spent, had to be spent quickly, a la FDR and the New Deal, and that's been done. Now, what would, uh, what would Joe Biden do differently? And that's where the issue of science versus skepticism comes in. When you have a president, presidents are supposed to lead, they're not supposed to disrupt. And in a time of crisis, um, this president has been as much a disruptor, um, you know, urging, recommending masks, saying, I'm not going to wear a mask myself. Um, fire Fauci, um, a totally uncalled for, possibly the most popular man in the United States uh, today, Dr. Fauci. So, um, uh, yeah, handling of the, of the virus will, will indeed be a big issue. Burden is on Biden, though, to show how he would do it differently. Right. Um, 
we have a question. I'm going to go ahead uh, unmute. Well, let's unmute Lauren um, to who has a question. Lydia, can you unmute her? Uh, Lauren, I think you are unmuted. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. can. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions for you, John. Um, how would you predict that both parties will deal with this issue of how are we going to pay back this big, big debt? Where's the money going to come from? What, what guesses would you make about that? And, um, and what makes you say, what are some of the elements of what makes you say that Joe Biden would win today? Okay. Uh, the, the, the second one first, he's ahead in, in every poll um, nationwide, and he's leading in, in Michigan, Wisconsin, not by much, um, but he is leading. He's leading in Pennsylvania. Right, right there, uh, that's enough, providing, of course, that um, he maintains the states uh, that that uh, have gone Democrat six out of the last seven or all seven of the last elections. Uh, plus the fact also that he's leading right now in Arizona and that in itself is 10 electoral votes. But that's today. Um, the election is not today. And we've seen, um, we've seen the unforeseen happen already and you know, who knows what's going to happen between now and, and then. In terms of where the money is going to come from, um, uh, that's one of those things where uh, the only way to deal with this is to talk about economic growth, is to talk about um, restoring stability and restoring then investment to grow the economy, to talk about the next economy of artificial intelligence and, and robotics. But then also, um, as Daniel Pink points out uh, in A Whole New Mind, the more kinds of personal and emotional services in, in medicine, in law, in, in healthcare, in education, uh, that need to be part of, uh, you know, a fast changing technology based economy to remind humans that they're still human. I know that's being vague, but the only way to deal with a $25 trillion deficit and growing is to talk about economic growth. That's basically how we've reduced and conquered debt uh, in the past. It certainly is not going to come from massive government cuts or massive uh, tax increases. There just isn't that kind of money uh, to be able to do that. Lauren, did you have another question? I, I do, and you, you touched on this, and so maybe you can even expand a little bit more, which is, how do you think down ballot votes of all uh, candidates of all kinds in all, many states, uh, of course, and you mentioned, of course, Amy McGrath and Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, um, how will those affect positively, negatively the presidential election, back and forth, both directions? I, I thank you for that question. This entire election hinges on millennials and Gen Z. If they turn out to vote in the same percentage of the total as they did in 2008 and slightly less in 2012, then a Democrat wins the presidency and has huge coattails because that means they're voting down ballot as well. It becomes a wave of some sort. If for some reason they are jaded uh, or disappointed, uh, don't believe, um, uh, and don't turn out to vote, as what happened um, significantly in 2016, then look for a Donald Trump victory and possibly a split election. Uh, I mean, right now, Amy McGrath, Mark Kelly, uh, and, and others are, uh, John Hickenlooper, are leading on their own without any help um, necessarily from, uh, from you know, the, the, the top of the ticket. But I think that 
That's the, the thing that we have, have to look at. Now, remember that uh, what undid Hillary Clinton um, in 2016 was that a lot of young people of color did not show up to vote for her in key states like Michigan and Wisconsin, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where it could have mattered. And so when we talk about millennials only, those who are, you know, say 26 uh, to 40 years of age, six or 40 percent of those millennials are non-white. Um, and so if there's a lower turnout among millennials, it, it could very well be a lower turnout among highly democratic leading, uh, leaning, I'm sorry, voters. Gen Z is uh, in itself, 18 to 24 year olds, is about evenly split. 50-50 uh, uh, white, non-white. If they don't turn out to vote, that's a lot of non-white voters. There was a time, Lauren, uh, before the virus, when we were seeing Donald Trump's numbers among non-white, young non-whites growing. Now, uh, that doesn't mean huge numbers, but you know, a, a Republican president normally can count on 8% or so, uh, or to 10% of, um, of non-white voters. And Donald Trump was posting about 14, 15%, I'm sorry, African-American voters. We saw Donald Trump picking up a few points among voters 18 to 29 years of age. Um, those are votes lost, or even those who said they were undecided, potential votes lost for Democrats if they don't turn out to vote. All right, great. Um, we're going to move on to the next couple. Of, and just a note on the time, we st started a little bit later. So it is about 2.47. We can go up to about 3 o'clock. I know there's a lot of questions. So uh, we may not be able to get to all of you. We probably will not, but we will get to as many as we can. Um, this next question is about the Electoral College. Um, and it's the question is, how do you feel about the Electoral College and how much power do you think is really in the individual vote? Um, so I've always been, let's not say fan, but let's, let's say a, a supporter and understander of the Electoral College. You know, the founding fathers were elitists, we know that, and we knew that they used terms like the rabble, and the mobs, uh, Jefferson used to call uh, uh, people in the streets de, de canai, um, le canai, the scum of the earth. And so they were worried about too much democracy. And so they established an electoral college for two reasons. One is to give some balance to uh, smaller states so that they could have their say. Uh, and at the same time to ensure that a demagogue um, didn't arise who could appeal directly to uh, 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 downscale voters and, um, and win the presidency. Uh, John Jay had said, hey, look, those who, he didn't say, hey, look, I'm saying that. Uh, th those who own the country should rule the country. Now, has that become outmoded? Well, you know, it depends. Um, uh, the sense was that with the breakdown of political parties, with the capacity of people to go on television and, and then social media, with the ability to raise money, not simply from wealthy donors, but, uh, you know, from the masses, instead of one person giving 13 million, why not have 13 million people give $1 and you still have a lot of money? Um, the Electoral College would prevent against uh, demagoguery uh, uh, being elected by popular vote. Um, I know there are people who have their feelings about what happened in 2016 and to some degree, and I apologize for this, we, we did elect a demagogue. On the other hand, um, we also had a, a woman run for president, uh, Hillary Clinton, who 
36% of the voters said they trusted to tell the truth, just was the wrong candidate at the wrong time. That's not the Electoral College's fault. How'd I do on that one? <laughs> that's, uh, it's always the question. I think that's one of the questions that we, we get quite, quite frequently. Um, and uh, I'm glad that was brought up. Um, there's a couple of questions here um, that, that I will ask. And then, actually, let me uh, ask one of our um, attendants who's had his hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and unmute Philippe. Philippe, are you unmuted? Unmute, unmute now. Yes. Yes, I can hear. OK. Uh, assuming that Joe Biden uh, sticks to his promise to nominate a woman as a vice president, presidential candidate, uh, would he be better off uh, bringing in somebody from a battleground state like Amy Klobuchar or Gretchen Whitmer, or uh, should, he, should he bring in somebody of color who might be perceived to be a little more to the left, like Kamala Harris or Stacey Abrams? Very good question. That was originally in my notes, but I figured uh, I would um, um, I, I, that would come up as a question. Count me as someone who who thinks that Gretchen Whitmer should be the um, the nominee. I know there are some pundits in D.C. who say that uh, a running mate hasn't delivered a state in a presidential election since Lyndon Johnson did in 1960. This is different though. Um, Biden needs to win Michigan, period. Uh, and, you know, anybody could help him win Michigan, but a very popular governor of Michigan um, uh, could do the trick. And look, let's not make any mistake about this. Those demonstrations in De Detroit are highly organized on the right. These are people who weren't going to vote for Gretchen Whitmer uh, or any Democrat ever. Uh, 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 so let's not in any way say that, that, that uh, it's because of her lack of popularity. Um, I, he will get a lot of blowback if he doesn't uh, select a, a woman of color. Um, here's the, the only problem I have with the, with the two most prominent names. Kamala Harris, um, unfortunately, by deciding early to go after Joe Biden, um, and even though the two of them have made peace, she provides uh, in her own words and her own video, the very talking points that uh, Donald Trump can use against Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, that uh, Joe Biden takes advantage of African-American voters, uh, was, never, was not a strong civil rights advocate and so on. Um, and so by having her up front uh, in, in the role of vice presidential nominee, um, that, that may be a, a bit too uh, explosive. Stacey Abrams is, is, is a great lady, and I think there could be a strong case that the, the election was taken from her in Georgia. But the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, Yale educated, and a, a good legislator, but she's only been a state senator, and she did lose. Uh, and she's only 46, maybe 47 years of age right now. Now, I know that's about the same age, 48, as Gretchen Whitmer, but she's the governor of a state, and she's been the state senate majority leader for years. So I think that Biden is better off uh, with, with Whitmer or Klobuchar. Um, and uh, I know that that could create some real difficulties with some African-American voters, but I think there are ways that, uh, that that can be made up, not the least of which is the strong support from Barack Obama and Michelle Obama in particular. Great, thank you. Um, given the time, I'm, uh, I'll be asking two more questions, um, and then uh, we will have to leave the others um, unanswered, but maybe we might get uh, John's thoughts on some of them after this, uh, after this talk. Uh, one, two questions relate to the actual campaigning um, of, for, for the president, mm. given the, 
that they can't really speak to crowds. They with the social distancing. What about presidential debates? How how do you see that's going to play out? Well, the, you know, the obvious answer is I don't know, except um, that I I think we we are all adjusting to a new era. We're all adjusting. First of all, we we moved from shaking hands to doing elbow bumps to social distancing to wearing masks. Campaigning is just another one of these things um, that we just get adjusted to. Um, many of us are online, most of us are online, the overwhelming majority, and many of us, including older people, especially those who, who have Facebook and grandchildren, are savvy with, uh, with Facebook. Um, and, and so, uh, this is just a new reality. Uh, media is pervasive in our lives, um, and we don't want to have our candidates out there risking their lives, or even more importantly, risking the lives of, uh, of people out there. It doesn't do any good to be wearing masks and rubber gloves and kissing babies. Um, this is just a new reality. Both candidates are good uh, in public situations. Um, and so they're just going to have to adjust, um, you know, to to these new realities. And I think they will, and I know we will. Right. All right. Thank you. And to our last questions is a little bit um, relating to uh, the the census that we just um, completed, and then how that's going to impact now or future elections. Uh, the question is, um, you know, your thoughts on the new race boxes on the census. Um, and if the census doesn't have full participation, how will that impact the voting districts and representation? Uh, for example, in a city of many immigrants, Louisville, um, who didn't get counted on the 2010 census, we worried that with the you know, COVID and all of our attempts for full participation, it's been thwarted. thwarted. So we haven't been able to realize what we were hoping. For. So what are your thoughts on the impact of representation, especially on future elections? Of course, we've got to see how this all plays out. So far, the reviews are that, that it went well, but we don't know. You know uh, um, the, first of all, the, the, um, the census is never accurate. Um, with all respect to the wonderful professionals who work in the Bureau of the Census, it's not just simply a question of, of uh, reaching every door or doing correct sampling. It's also the fact that culturally, there are people who are just not disposed to filling out a census. That includes, unfortunately, a number of, of minority groups and uh, foreign born groups. Um, uh, I have always been, uh, over the last three censuses, um, on a task force on hard to reach groups in particular, uh, representing on that task force, both as a, a professional and a member of the task force, um, Arab Americans. Um, I mean, you can, and I have sat in rooms filled with, with Arab Americans um, and have assured them that the census is a good thing and have them say to me, yeah, you're gonna take all this information, you're gonna share it with the CIA and the FBI to harass us. There's no way that you can counter um, that sensibility. And so these groups, uh, Native Americans, um, uh, African Americans, American born African Americans, are just not disposed to filling out the census. So we have undercounts. It's only a question of how much of those can we neutralize, um, you know, with, with best practices. Uh, so we're going to have to wait and see how this you know, how, how, how this plays out uh, this year, but understand that it will be an imperfect uh, calculation, no matter what. Thank you, John. Um, obviously, given where we are, there's so many uncertainties, and I'm sure any other year you might be able to uh, more reliably predict certain things that it's just hard to say at this point, and mm -hmm. it'll probably be very different once we reach uh, November or close to November. Um, I want to thank you again uh, for joining us today and really sharing your 
expertise expertise and any data that you've uh, you've you've been getting for this and um, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to return back to our bluegrass state in the future when this is over. Um, do you have any uh, last remarks you want to make before we move on? No, I think I've said it all, but okay. I'll tell you if you have some leftover questions, email them to me and over the next few days, I'll be happy to uh, to answer them via email. Great, we will do that. And um, if you all, uh, everybody in the audience that wants to um, you know, learn more about John's work and certainly subscribe to his podcast, The Zogby Report, um, do visit his website. We'll pr provide that in our follow-up email as well. It's johnzogbystrategies.com. Um, we are going to be sending out a quick survey after this program. We would really appreciate all of you uh, sending uh, you know, just sending, taking a few minutes to fill it out. It is our very first time navigating this kind of platform. So whatever suggestions, ideas that you may have, please do let us know. We want to be able to make this as pleasant as possible. We all know that uh, these seminars can be exhausting. So we do want to respect your one hour time. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time with, out with us. So thank you all. Thank you, John. And uh, you. please do stay healthy and well. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.